Okay, so as I mentioned, so the, the first talk was uh, uh, more focused on uh, what, 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 what insights thinking of computational processes can give us vis-a-vis -vis, uh, physics. And now the second, uh, the second talk will we'll look in the other direction. So before focusing more in this talk on computational complexity theory, something that uh, we talked about at the beginning, uh, in, in, in detail at the beginning of yesterday. So unlike computability theory, which, uh, which focuses on the, the computational problems, well, on the, pro on the problems that can be computed in principle, as we saw yesterday, computational complexity theory focuses on the problems that can be computable given that we have various resource constraints. So and typically these are going to be in terms of time and space. And for the purpose of this talk, I'll be focusing generally on time, which is the most important measure, the more important measure. Now, as we saw yesterday, the complexity theoretic classes are can be can be structured in terms of a like conceptual space with of problems that is that is carved up by these complexity theory classes theoretic classes. And so we say that, you know, one class is contained within another, or properly contained, or, or you know, like, Richard, or maybe just a, a non-strict subset, and so on. And of course, uh, quantum computing comes along. And according to some, quantum computing seems to really upset the apple cart of uh, complexity theory. And so of the consequences for complexity, for computational complexity theory, uh, here, these are some of the things that some people have said. So Bernstein and Vazirani in their 97 paper write, and they don't really write more than that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote them anyway. So they say, we must re-examine the foundations of computational complexity theory. So in that case, I think they're, they're doing what a lot of scientists do is that, that in the first paragraph of their paper, they make, they make bold claims, but then they don't proceed to say anything more about it. Because that's not really what their paper is about. Their paper is actually about more uh, scientifically interesting things than than, uh, than these bold claims. Like that. That's the way I would interpret that statement. There, it's kind of like hyperbole, kind of like an, like an, like a propaganda. But philosophers have 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 commented on it as well. And and there's a there's a more serious paper that that talks about these issues, and that's uh, written by so the, my co-author on the on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry, Emma Taggart. And I disagree with him as as we'll see uh, as the talk goes along. But uh, Ahmed writes in his 2007 paper, to my mind, the strongest implication of uh, quantum computing is on the, uh, for complexity theory, is on the autonomous character of some of the theoretical entities used in computer science. And we'll see, we'll see what he means by that in more detail as the talk goes along. So what I want to argue in this talk, essentially, is that quantum computing does not overturn the foundations of complexity, computational complexity theory. As, as I'm going to uh, uh, argue and elucidate, quantum, uh, computational complexity theory is best thought of as a practical science. So now what, what, these, what these quotes from Bernstein and Vazirani and from Hagar are getting at is that quantum computing shows us that we need to give up model, ind model independence in the context of, of, of computational complexity theory. And they take computational complexity theory to be, to, 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 to be a science that seeks for model independence in its definitions. And for Hagar, and for, and for Hagar the, the lesson of quantum computing is that we need to give up this notion of model independence. You know? and, then, and, and that's going to have consequences larger consequences, broader con consequences for other areas of philosophy. And we'll see what he means by that a bit later. So what I would argue uh, 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 opposing that idea is that, I mean, really, when if you, if you look at computational complexity theory, you look at its history, you look at, you look at the, the way it's developed, model independence shouldn't be actually thought of as a foundation for computational complexity theory. In fact, it, 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 it it not even even before quantum computing it should not have been thought of in that way that doesn't mean that quantum computing doesn't illuminate computational complexity theory but what but the way that it illuminates it is by reminding us of this of, of the fact that model independence isn't really foundational for computational complexity theory in the way that some other things are which which I'll, which I'll mention as the talk goes along and there's a broader point which I'm not going to talk about but but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say it uh, I'm going to make this this bold bold assertion that that 
that looking at computational complexity theory, it's it's an, and in the light of quantum computing and, and what it highlights about it, it just emphasizes to us the, uh, like a, a larger lesson that science doesn't always progress, at least and not even mathematical science it doesn't always progress through the absolute identification of so-called fundamental entities. It, science is often built upon pragmatically justified foundations and conceptual structures. And you'll see what I mean by that as hopefully as we as we go along. OK, so we'll begin with Hilbert's program. Okay. So Hilbert's program is, is to provide, in some sense, a finitistic foundation for mathematics. So, so Hilbert's program, generally speaking, so he, he, wanted to, he wanted to ground our use of infinitary mathematics, the mathematics he inherited from, Kant, from Cantor and, which, and, and the classical mathematics that he used to prove a number of important theorems in his career. And he wanted to, I mean, it wasn't, I'm, I make it sound selfish, but it wasn't, it was, that wasn't the point, but the point is that he wanted to ground infinitary mathematics. <clears throat> and the way that he, he envisioned that we could, that we should go about doing this is by, is by showing that infinitary mathematics could be grounded in a con, could be interpreted, I mean, so we could, we could furnish a concrete finitistic interpretation. Of, of of infinitary math, uh, mathematical manipulations, we could give a we can give a concrete finite model that was in some sense consistent with the with the infinitary with the infinitary model. As part of that program, uh, one of the one part of that program was the Entscheidens problem, which we which we talked about yesterday, which is the, the capital uh, capital capital T capital D decision problem, which is the uh, which is the, the problem to to uh, to provide an effective procedure to determine for any arbitrary formula in first order logic, whether that formula is provable or not provable from the axioms. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, Alan Turing famously argued that the Einstein's problem was not solvable. And he did so uh, in, I mean, he founded his, his result on what has now called Turing's thesis, which is equivalent to Church's thesis. And um, and so the idea of Turing's thesis is that we would like to say something in a formal sense about the Entscheidung's problem, and in order to do so, we need to we need to formalize the notion of an effective procedure. So the informal notion that we that we get from thinking about human computation, and we want to map that informal notion onto this formal notion, right? And so we think about what's essential. In the practice of human practice of human computation, for instance, that the computer has a particular state of mind, that that uh, that so she has a particular state of mind when she's carrying out a, out a computation. So after she reads a given symbol from a page, that 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 causes the, her state of mind to transition in a certain way, and then she also is able to write to the page and so on. So the control unit captures her her state of mind, the instruction set that she's memorized, uh, the read write hat. Uh, head uh, captures the fact that she's able to read and from the paper and write to the paper and the paper itself is modeled as a tape. So it's not literally that we imagine that she's writing on a one dimensional tape, but what's essential about her writing to a, to a, to a notepad can be captured, you know, minimally by this, by the, by one dimensional tape in that way. That's, that's the idea. We want to, we want to, I, I, extract what's essential about the process of human computation. So as to give a formal characterization of it, which we can then use to show that the Entscheidung's problem is not, is not solvable. So the Entscheidung's problem is the problem to provide an effective method. So when we say effective in computability theory, we don't distinguish between, uh, we, don't, we don't consider resource costs. So this is the context of computability theory. In computational complexity theory, we we do make these finer distinctions. So we generally are talking about effective methods, but we but we 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 want to distinguish between those effective methods that are tractable and those effective methods that are not tractable. Now, computational complexity theory is a discipline that's relatively young. So uh, computability, well, computability theory is also very relatively young. So computability theory is less than a hundred years old. Uh, uh, I mean, it has precursors, of course, but but like in this modern form, which which you know. You can think of as beginning in the 1930s with, uh, with Church and Turing and Clean and, and Post and so on. 
it's relatively young. It's less than 100 years old. Complexity theory is even younger, which makes sense, given that it's built on computability theory. So complexity theory uh, really starts to take shape in the 1960s with the work of, uh, of, of, of Alan Cobham and, and Jack Edmonds, especially. But not only them, not only them, but also the work of people like Hart Manis and Stearns and so on. So this is work that started in the 1960s. But it's interesting, though, that even before the 60s, like some of the central questions in complexity theory were, were, uh, were, were anticipated by none other than, I mean, I guess it's not surprising because Gödel did everything, but uh, it was anticipated by, by Kurt Gödel. So in, I think it was this letter that Gödel wrote to von Neumann was uncovered in the 1990s, I think. Uh, so it's not as if this letter influenced complexity theory at all. It didn't because nobody knew of it. Uh, it was uncovered in the 90s, much later. And this is a letter that, that, that Kurt Gödel wrote to, wrote to John von Neumann. And he wrote it to von Neumann when uh, von Neumann was basically on his deathbed. So it's not clear that von Neumann even read the letter. Like, I think he died shortly after this. But in, in any case, the, the letter that Gödel wrote to von Neumann uh, asked, him, uh, asked him a question concerning the proposition phi of n, which is the number of steps that are needed in the worst case to decide if some proposition phi has a proof of length n. So it's analogous to the Entscheidung's problem, right? So in the Entscheidung's problem, in, in the original form, we ask whether some proposition is provable or not provable, period. Now the question is adapted. It's a complexity theoretic version of the question. We want to know whether a given proposition is provable in a number of at a number of at a given number of steps and he conjectured that if phi of n was proportional to n squared then this would and quoting him he said it would clearly indicate that despite the insolvability of the Entscheidung's problem the mental effort of the mathematician in the case of yes or no questions <clears throat> could be completely replaced by machines so what does he mean by that well he goes on he says simply select an n that's so large but if the machine yields no result, there would then also be no reason to think further about the problem. So, so what does he mean by this? So, like, so the idea is that if you choose an N that's large enough, such that a machine, because an automatic machine generally that runs each step faster than a human would, would run it. So <clears throat> you choose an N that's large enough such that a machine could actually, could actually, uh, could actually perform that many steps. And, and steps in a reasonable amount of time. Whereas if you ask a human being to do it, it would be like beyond the bounds of a human lifetime, for instance. So if you chose an end large enough and the machine was not able to find a proof of that length for a given proposition, then for our purposes, for human purposes, you might say, you, 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 could, you could effectively, well, effectively not in the, you could essentially, you could for pragmatic purposes, take, take, that, take that problem as not being provable, right? And so you can, in that way, do away with human mathematicians. You can just kind of, if, if a computer was able to generate a proof in only this many steps, or find a proof in only this many steps, then we wouldn't need ma human mathematicians because we, we could just ask a computer. Right? And so Gödel actually conjectured that this might be plausible. Right? And so he was asking von Neumann's opinion about that. <clears throat> so another way of thinking about this is, well, so in response to, in, in response to this, in the, in the response to the, the idea that we can do away with the mental effort of the mathematician, I mean, the knee-jerk response, which is, a, which, is, which is entirely correct, is that, well, I mean, human beings do more than just computation, right? Human mathematicians do something different from just computation. I mean, in part, they do computation, but they also, when a human being discovers a proof, she doesn't just calculate it. The human computer will use her, in, I mean, the human mathematician will use her ingenuity, right? She'll, the human mathematician will, will look at the hidden structure, will look at the structure of a problem, not necessarily hidden, but look at, look at the structure of a problem and, de and determine the best way to attack it, right? And so in that way, she carves up the, carves up the problem and finds a nice, nice solution. And that way, she is able to discover a proof. Right? That's more than just computation. But while that's true, if it were the case that an automatic computer could find a proof 
in this many steps, steps proportional to n squared, then it would, despite the fact that you that, that human beings do have ingenuity, nobody will nobody is denying that. But the fact that they have an ingenuity is irrelevant because we wouldn't need to appeal to it. We could just run, we could just ask the computer. And even though the computer had no ingenuity, it could still give us an answer just as easily, right? As, as, a, as a human being with all of that fancy ingenuity could do. That's the idea here. That's a deeper point. Now, implicit in this is the idea that if phi of n is proportional to n squared, that that's a small number of steps. Now that's actually, that's confirmed. I mean, confirmed in the sense that, that modern complexity theory agrees with that. And in fact, modern complexity theory uh, makes a more general claim. So in modern complexity theory, it's not just n squared, but any polynomial function is considered to be a small number of steps, right? And in modern complexity theory, we say that something is solvable in a small number of steps when it's polynomial in that way. Right, and there are there are synonyms for this. So sometimes it's it's said that a problem is efficiently solvable, tractable, feasible, easy, and so on. And when it's not easy, we call it a hard problem or infeasible problem or intractable problem, not efficiently solvable. So these are these are these are all trying to say the same thing essentially. Okay, so why do we think that this is a good criterion for an efficient solution. Well, one way to motivate motivate this is by using uh, the programmer's intuition. You might say that if you have an efficient program that makes calls to a number of efficient subroutines, then the overall program should also be thought of efficient uh, as efficient. More formally speaking, this is just the property that polynomial functions have that they're closed under composition. Okay, it's just. It just, it's just that. OK, so now in complexity theory, as we saw, as we saw yesterday, the class P is, the, is defined as the, is, is, uh, is the class of problems for which uh, it takes. Yes? Michael, so Vincent has a question, a brief question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, Michael, but uh, okay. Uh, I was not able to understand the, why, the, the argument by Gedel. Why, why in, in, in this example you propose in the letter to von Neumann, why ingenuity is, is useless and there is no difference uh, if, if the complexity is uh, of this kind? Can you repeat the argument to clarify? Sure. Thank you very much. Sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. Of course. Uh, so let me go back a bit. So, so the idea is that, okay, so I mean, so it's it's not the case that we're denying that human beings have ingenuity. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of ingenuity from this point of view is to be able to to discover a proof more quickly, you might say, than one could discover a, pu a proof by, you know, just blindly following a set of rules, right? And so that's what ingenuity gives you. In addition to like like the like whatever like deeper understanding and so on, what it, in a pragmatic sense, what ingenuity gives you is that it, is that you don't have to like like blindly write down all of the possible syntactic combinations of of, of symbols in order to find a proof, as a computer might do, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can you can see right to the heart of a problem and then say, ah, I know how to solve it. You know, I know how to get a proof of this. That's what human ingenuity, like informally characterized, does. But the thing is, if if sol if if finding a proof is easy in the sense that it only takes a few steps, then from a pragmatic point of view, we don't need ingenuity. I mean, we might need ingenuity to program the computer, but we don't need ingenuity in the context of proving a particular theorem because the the, the mathematician with all of her fancy ingenuity can just stay home and we can instead put our resources into the computer and say, here, computer, I want you to find a proof of length less than or equal to n for this proposition. And it won't take that long for the computer to do it. Because this is, if it were actually n squared, that's pretty, that's pretty small. And, and, and that, would be, that would be easy. And so although it's not an argument that human beings don't have ingenuity, 
it's an <laughs> argument that it's an argument that ingenuity becomes not so useful, so okay. relevant in the sense that it's not so useful to us anymore. But Gede, Gede was aware that uh, many kind of problem has not this kind of polynomial, even if the, the concept of polynomial and the exponential complexity was not so clear like now. Uh, Gader was was uh, aware of this difference, so I cannot understand how he can uh, uh, make this hypothesis that uh, if n uh, is proportional to n square. Uh, I mean, uh, all I can say is this is this is a this is a literal this is literally lift, lifted from the letter. So I mean, of course, okay. yeah, no problem. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not a, not a not a girdle, girdle scholar. Okay, so okay. Say, this is what he yeah. writes in this letter. Okay, okay. Thank and, you. And, 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 and this is how to make sense of what he's saying. Okay. I'll, I'll go on. Okay. So, right. So I was saying that as we saw yesterday, um, so the class P is the class of problems such that it takes on the order of a polynomial number of steps to compute a solution with certainty. Another way of saying that is that the class P is the class of problems that are efficiently computable by deterministic Turing machine. And similarly, the class NP is the class of problems such that it takes on the, on the, on the order of a polynomial number of steps to verify a solution with certainty. So I didn't actually give that exact definition yesterday. I, I talked in terms of a non-deterministic Turing machine, but the two definitions are equivalent. And I alluded to, to how that works, right? I, we saw the, the, the transition diagram, and I said, you kind of have to choose the right path, right? And so the same idea here, right? So if, you've, if you, by choosing the right path means I, you take that path, you can take that path, and you can feed it to a deterministic Turing machine, which will then be able to, to check that the path correctly gives you a proof of that proposition. So in that sense, the class NP can also be characterized as a class of problems that are efficiently verifiable by deterministic, by deterministic Turing machine. And as we saw yesterday, it's also the class of problems that are that will first the computer will give you a solution. A non-deterministic Turing machine will give you a solution efficiently. And so we saw an example of a non-deterministic Turing machine yesterday. I'm not going to go through it in detail again. But here's an undeterministic Turing machine where, given starting in the input state zero, you can go in multiple ways. And you can show that this non-deterministic Turing machine will accept any string ending in zero, zero in the sense that there's a possible path through the state space that ends in an accept state. OK. Now, as you saw yesterday, we can also uh, talk about probabilistic Turing machines. And probabilistic Turing machines are the machines such that it takes on the order of a polynomial number of steps to compute with the probability that, that, the, that, the, that the solution yielded is a correct one that's greater than 2 thirds. And another way of describing this class is the class of problems that are efficiently computable by a probabilistic Turing machine. So now, I mean, note that as I said uh, yesterday, properly, properly speaking, we should think of these as classes of decidable languages, not so much problems, even though we can, it's, it's, it's okay to talk in either way. But properly speaking, we should think of these as classes of decidable not languages. And so here's the, the prime number representation example that I gave yesterday. Right? And I also want to point out, I mean, it should be clear, but from what I said before, but when we say efficient here, we are implicitly identifying polynomial with efficient. Okay, okay so now the Church Turing thesis, I mean, well, specifically the Turing thesis here, identifies the class of computable functions with, with, with those computable by Turing machine. Now, in its in itself, the Church Turing thesis doesn't have anything to do with physics, and it doesn't have anything to do with complexity theory either. But in complexity theory, or when people comment on complexity theory, often you'll hear people talk about the so-called strong Church Turing thesis. Right? You'll also hear talk about a physical Church Turing thesis. So um, the physical Church Turing thesis says uh, that any 
any physical process that implements a computation must be Turing. No, no, must like, any physical process that implements a computation must be Turing computable as well, right? Uh, that computation must be Turing computable as well. The strong Church-Turing thesis is not that; it's a thesis that's relevant to complexity theory, and it essentially says that. If P is efficiently computable, then P is a member of BPP. So I'll note here that I'm going to continue thinking of it in terms of BPP in this way, but I'll note here actually that, so it used to be the case that complexity theorists thought that probabilistic classical computation was, was a, is able to solve more problems tractably than deterministic classical computation. But Relatively recently, in the early 2000s, um, this opinion has started to change based on a number of results. So it turns out that there's a de-randomization program in complexity theory where we are able to convert probabilistic algorithms into, into, uh, into deterministic algorithms. So it actually seems to be the case that P and BPP are not different. And so it's fine actually to phrase the strong church during thesis in terms of either P or BPP, assuming that that's right, which it seems like it's, it is right. I'm going to continue using BPP, though, and the reason I want to continue using it is because deterministic computation and probabilistic computation have different success criteria, right? So in order to say that a computation is successful in the, in, in the deterministic case, we have to say that it gives us a solution, the right solution with certainty. Whereas in the probabilistic case, that isn't necessary. We just needed to eventually approach unity as we, as we increase the number of runs, right? So those are, those are different, there's a different success criteria. And the reason it's useful to continue using BPP is because the quantum computational complexity theory, theoretic class, BQP, is also probabilistic and also has a probabilistic success criteria. So I'm going to continue to use BPP rather than P when I talk about the strong church turing thesis. And now that I've introduced the strong church turing thesis, I want to I want to change the phrase that I use because I don't think it's I think it's a little confusing to talk about church turing thesis in this context because the church turing thesis doesn't really say anything I would I would claim that about about complexity theory it's a, it's a question of computability. And so I think a better term for this, and this is the term that I'm going to use in the remainder of the talk, is what I'll call the universality thesis. Because when we say that P is efficiently computable, if and only if P is a, is, is a member of BPP, then what we're saying is that BPP is a universal class for efficient computation, right? So there are many models of computation, right? There are Turing machine models, von Neumann architectures, and so on. And the polynomial, the solvable problems in any model, if we take the union, the union of them all, that's going to be the same as BPP. That's what the universality thesis amounts to. There's also what I think is a more interesting thesis, uh, but it's related to the universality thesis. So we'll see later why I think it's more interesting. And this, this thesis is what uh, I'm going to call the invariance thesis. And so what this thesis says is that given any two models of computation, MI and MJ, it's the case that MI is polynomially, so is, is so an efficient solution to a problem in model MI is convertible to a solution in, in under model MJ using only at most a polynomial number of extra time steps. Right? So what that amounts to is every model of every reasonable model, and I'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later, every reasonable model of computation is efficiently simulable by every other reasonable model. And again, here, that's also implicit. We're talking about reasonable models, quote unquote. Okay. Now, BQP, which is the class of problems efficiently solvable by a quantum computer, is defined analogously to BPP. It's, so it's the, it's, it's the class of problems such that it takes on the order of a polynomial number of steps to compute a solution with a quantum computer, computer 
such that the probability that the solution yielded is a correct one that's greater than or equal to two thirds. And so now we can ask about the relation between BPP and BQP. And so one thing uh, we can say, and this is this is absolutely not controversial at all, is that is that BQP is at least as large as BPP. And the reason why that is is because given given uh, because we can always simulate a classical coin toss in a quantum computer by using a Hadamard gate and a measurement, right? So, for instance, imagine we begin uh, the, the imagine the, that the computer begins in the state zero, then we subject it to a Hadamard transformation that transforms the, the state into a superposition, and then we just measure that state and we get a 50-50 probability of getting zero and one. And so in that way, we can simulate a fair co a coin toss using like one extra step, basically. And so we can always simulate a probabilistic computation using a quantum computer. So the more interesting question is whether BPP is a proper subset of BQP. In other words, whether the class of problems solvable by a quantum computer is larger than efficiently solvable by a quantum computer is larger than the class of problems efficiently solvable by a classical probabilistic computer. OK, so we discussed quantum computing in more detail. I'm going to give uh, a kind of very uh, simple, playful example. And the reason I want to do this, I just want to emphasize one of the distinctions between quantum computation and, and, and classical probabilistic computation that I didn't really get to yesterday, that I didn't really talk about so much yesterday, is the, is the distinction in the way that probabilities are calculated. And so we can illustrate this with a very simple example. So consider a classical computer. Okay, so imagine this is some kind of classical computer. And it's a very simple thing. And this is the, the state transition diagram for this classical computer, which is extremely uninteresting because this computer essentially does nothing. <laughs> but we can talk about how it works. And so the way that this works is, so we have this box. It's got a little readout, uh, little readout uh, area, which is has a flap. All right. So the way this works is that you, the first step is that you open the flap, take note of the of, of the initial state of the computer, then you close the flap then you press the run button one or more times and then you open the flap and and take a note of the output the output state okay and the way that the transition works is that if the initial state is in uh, is zero then if you push the button once then with probability one half it'll just stay in the state zero and with probability one half it'll go to the state one so, oh, before I before I go on, I want to mention that this example is actually adapted from a nice paper by uh, by David Deutsch and uh, and Rosella Lubakini from I forget I think it's two thousand I don't know like it's it's it didn't, it doesn't look their example doesn't look like this but it's essentially the same thing so I'll just mention that um, and okay so this is the way our classical computer operates so now we can talk about the probability given that the computer starts in the state zero, that if I push the button once, that the computer is in the state zero again. And that's going to be the same as a probability that if it starts in the state zero and, and, and I push the button once, that it goes to one. And, and also this is going to be the same as a probability given that I start in the state one, that it goes to zero, and so on. The probability is going to be one half in all cases. We can also talk about a two-push experiment. So in this case, we, we open the flap, take note of the initial state, close the flap, push the button twice, and then read out the result. And now we can talk about the probability that given, given that the computer starts in the state zero, and then I push the button twice, that it ends up in the state zero. And we do this, well, we can just calculate it in this way. And again, we come up with the answer that the probability is 1 half. OK, so classical computers, as we mentioned, uh, as, I, as we discussed yesterday, are uh, manipulate bits. And so a bit physically can be implemented as some kind of physical system in which we can distinguish two states, like a light switch. In a quantum computer, we manipulate qubits, not bits. And these can be physically instantiated by you know, the spin of a spin-and-a-half spin system, for example. 
And unlike a classical bit, as we saw yesterday, quantum computer can be in a, a superposition state in addition to be, well, these are also trivial superpositions, but in ge generally the quantum bit is in, a, is in a superposition state of following form. So given a quantum computer that begins in the state psi, which is ascribed by this superposition, and imagine that we have a similar box to the one we just saw, and we push the, the Q button this time, then the quantum computer is going to transition to being in a state phi, which is going to be described by a different superposition. OK, so now we can consider the, uh, we consider more detail how this falls. So if, if the computer begins in the state 0 and we push the Q button once, then the computer is going to evolve to this state, right? so as we saw yesterday. Uh, sorry, oh, actually not as we saw yesterday. This is a different transformation. This is not a transformation that we looked at yesterday. I'm just imagining some transformation that's useful for illustrative purposes. So imagine that we have a transformation Q that takes zero to this state. Okay? And imagine that the transformation Q takes one to this state. And we'll call these states chi and xi for short. So now, given this transformation, given the way that the computer works, we can talk about the probability that if we begin that beginning in state zero, if we measure what the, what the probability so so given so given that we say we we the probability that we <coughs> result that 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 a measurement results in zero given that we started in the state uh, zero ket, and we can calculate the probability here as uh, yeah as basically one. And the probability, given that we start in the state uh, chi, and we measure that we get zero, is going to be the mod square of i over root two, which is one half. Okay, so we can talk just like in the class. Okay, we talk about probabilities associated with measurements in a particular state. And now we can run this gate again, which is again a unitary transformation that we saw yesterday. And so from the state chi. If we push the Q button again from there, and given the way that it transforms zero and one, we can show that we're going to get we're going to get the state one as a result. And if we start in the state one and we do it this twice, then we're going to get the state zero as a result. And so we can talk about the probability given that we start in the state zero and we push the Q button twice, that if we measure, we'll get one. And the probability here is one, whereas the probability that if we start in the state one and push the Q button twice and measure that we get zero, and that's also going to be one. So this functions essentially, pushing the Q button twice functions as a not gate, effectively. Right. So if I start in state zero and I push the Q button twice, I end up with one and vice versa. And so we can visualize the way this quantum computer, so imagine now this is a quantum computer, we can actually construct a kind of state transition diagram. So I'm suppressing uh, phase, global phase factors here, but essentially this works like kind of like a probabilistic computer, right? So we have deterministic transitions. So if we start in the state zero and we push Q, then we go to the state chi, which is that superposition state. And then if we push Q again, we end up in one, if we push Q again, we end up in Xi, which is that, and so on. And we deterministically transition between these states whenever we pr press the Q button. But then in any particular state, we might decide to choose uh, to press, to open the flap, right? And when we open the flap, if we happen to be in the state zero, then we're certainly going to stay here. And if we open the flap when we happen to be in the state chi, then with probability one half, we'll, go, we'll transition to zero, and with probability one half, we'll transition to one and so on. Now let's compare the now let's compare the operation of the classical computer that we saw before with the operation of the quantum computer. And so in the quantum in the classical case we saw earlier that one push experiments the the results of one the probability for the result of a one per, a push experiment is going to be one half no matter what we're, no matter what we're looking at and the same th same is going to be true for for a uh, or, uh, or for pushing the, pub, uh, the Q button given uh, a quantum computer once. Uh, 
But once we get to two push experiment, we see that while the classical probabilities remain the same, the quantum probabilities are going to be changed. So this is because you know it's 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 an interference effect, right? So some of the possible paths will cancel out, and some of them will construct constructively interfere, and we'll get different probabilities here. Okay, so so that was a simple example, but I just it's just meant to illustrate that, that another aspect of the way of the way quantum computers differ differ from classical computers is that they implement a different there's a di they, they use a different way of calculating probability. But it also illustrates that. <clears throat> Quantum computers are a kind of probabilistic machine. Okay. okay. Anyways, so again, there's there's quite a lot of there's been, there there was quite a lot of hype about quantum computing. Computing. This is from I can't read the date, but it's from a while ago. Maybe things have calmed down a little bit since then, but but still, there's still quite a bit of hype about quantum computers. And so we can ask the question whether quantum computers are able to solve or are able to to confirm Gödel's implicit conjecture here, right? And the answer is no, they don't show that the restricted Unschrödinger's problem, which I'll call this one, is, is solvable in polynomial time, right? Interestingly, though, as I mentioned yesterday, so uh, it's possible to get some improvement, right? So, uh, so Grover's algorithm is an NP-complete problem with, similarly to the restricted and Schrödinger's problem, and you can get a quadratic improvement in performance given Grover's algorithm over the best-known classical computer, although it's relative to an oracle. But even so, so it, so it, it so it seems like there is some interesting there are some interesting things to say about this question in the light of quantum computers, but it isn't the case um, that any quantum algorithm that we that we have seen so far allows us to answer yes to this question, certainly not. But of course we can talk about this question, the second one, right? Whether, whether BQP is strictly larger than BPP. And as we talked about uh, yesterday, there's indirect evidence, you might say, for, for the for the positive answer to that question. And so we saw that there are oracle results that show us that relative to certain oracles that, that BQP is strictly larger than BPP. Although as we, as we also mentioned yesterday, the uh, oracle results should be taken with a grain of salt. I mean, for, to take a, like a particularly vivid example, as I mentioned yesterday, there's an oracle with respect to which P is equal to NP. And there's another oracle with respect to which P is not equal to NP. And so we need to, so it doesn't seem that oracles are useful in that case. And there are many cases where, where it, it, they're not useful and maybe even obscure a problem when we use them. Uh, but there's not only Oracle results. So Shor's algorithm is an algorithm that doesn't uh, essentially employ an Oracle. Um, but in that case, it's, it's, it's not conclusive evidence because we only have, uh, we, we, we're only able to show that the quantum algorithm improves upon the best known classical algorithm. And that would be, that, that would be, it, it's, it's, it's extremely interesting, but it would be even more interesting if we had some principled reason for, for thinking that there is no uh, classical algorithm, algorithm that can improve upon, improve upon the current one, right? And I th think the, the consensus, generally speaking, is that probably the current uh, factoring algorithm classically is the best we can do, but there's no principled reason why. Like, it wouldn't, it wouldn't overturn complexity theory in the way that some other results would. To put it that way, right? Because, and and part of the way to illustrate this is the very fact that we have a classical algorithm that's sub-exponential right, shows us that there's that there's some structure to the conceptual space of the factoring problem that we're getting at in order to get that sub-exponential result. And so it's it's not crazy to think that there might be further structure that we haven't yet found that would allow us to improve our techniques even more so. So although most people think that the quantum algorithm is probably more, is more efficient than any classical algorithm we could come up with, it's certainly not, it's certainly something that people could be wrong about. Just as people were wrong about the fact that, seem to have been wrong about the fact that BPP is strictly larger than P, right? It was only relatively recently that people started to, started to have a different opinion about that. And so the same could plausibly happen about Shor's algorithm and factoring. Right. So 
I would still call Shor's algorithm evidence for, for this claim. But one needs to take all of this evidence with a grain of salt. That said, for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to just assume that this is true. So we're going to explore the consequences for complexity, for complexity theory on the assumption that this statement is, is a true one. OK, so let's come back to the universality thesis. Okay, so the universality thesis, uh, the way that Bernstein and Bazzarani put it, uh, asserts that any reasonable model of computation can be efficiently simulated on a probabilistic Turing machine. And so what this amounts to is the claim that if P is an, is an efficiently computable problem, then it's a member of the class BPP. And so uh, Amit, uh, Amit Hagar, as I mentioned earlier, comments on this and he writes, uh, so it's the same quote that I gave earlier, but now I'm gonna, I'm giving a bit more of it. So he says, to my mind, the strongest implication is on the autonomous character of some of the theoretical entities used in computer science. Given that quantum computers may be able to efficiently solve classically intractable problems, hence redescribe the space of computational complexity, computational concepts and even computational kinds such as an efficient algorithm or the class NP will become machine dependent and recourse to hardware will become inevitable in any analysis of the notion of computational complexity. And he, and he argues that there are further implications to this for, for cognitive science, for philosophy of mind, et cetera. So what he's alluding to here is that, so on, on, certain, compu on certain theories of mind, especially computational theories of mind, um, we, think of, we, we, we think of the mind, so for example, the one example that I'm familiar with is uh, there's, a, there's a view called evolutionary psychology, which is uh, founded on a kind of massive modularity thesis. So it holds that our brain is composed of functional modules, and these modules are adapted, are adapted to to problems that that uh, to, to to problems that are inherently complex, and then they 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 adapt to be able to solve those problems efficiently. And so we, and so in order to in order to cash out these notions in the philosophy of mind. Hagar argues we have we need we need to have some way of saying what intractable means in a kind of model independent sense if we want this to be useful for for cognitive science, right? Whereas if quantum computing breaks the complexity theoretic paradigm in the sense that it violates this thesis, then that has implications for fields like this one. We need to we need to be careful. It, it'll be harder to make the claim that. Uh, that that the mind is computational in a functional sense if if the very if the very notions of complexity are model dependent at least that's the claim that Hagar wants to make but you might be a little puzzled even so so if you uh, so if you look at Bernstein and Vazirani's way of putting in this claim so they call the universality thesis the thesis that any reasonable model of computation can be efficiently simulated on a probabilistic Turing machine. So it's strange to say that this is a model independent notion because it's defined explicitly with respect to a given machine. So in what way was, is the universality thesis expressing the kind of model independence to begin with, right? So one might be a bit puzzled by this. <clears throat> now, the sense that's meant by Hagar and the sense that's meant by people who talk about the universality thesis is, I think it's nicely uh, given by uh, this quote from Nielsen and Schrang's uh, great book on uh, quantum information and computation. So they write uh, on page 140 of that book, the truth of the universality thesis would be great news for the theory of computational complexity for it implies that attention may be restricted to the probabilistic Turing machine model of computation. So as an aside, I find it a little weird to think that, <clears throat> that um, it would be great, it would, it would be great news to, to like, it would be bad news to find out something different <laughs> that, I mean, like science is about learning new things after all. So like, I find that weird that uh, given that something doesn't fit into some a, a priori conception we have, that that would be bad news. But that aside, they continue, they say, after all, if a problem has no polynomial resource solution on a probabilistic Turing machine, 
than the, univer than the universality of Turing efficiency implies that it has no efficient solution on any computing device. Thus, the universality of Turing efficiency implies that the entire theory of computational complexity will take on an elegant model independent form if the notion of efficiency is identified with polynomial resource algorithms. So the, the kind of idea I take them to be uh, uh, alluding to here is that, so is well, essentially that we think of the class BPP as a universal class for efficiently computable problems. And so given that this is true, if we have a series of statements such as the following, so problem P1 is efficiently solvable under the model MA, problem P2 is efficiently solvable under the model MB, and so on. If this is true, then, well, we can just replace that with P1 is efficiently solvable by probabilistic Turing machine, and similarly for P2 and for P3 and P4 and so on. And I mean, eventually we'll just get tired of saying this, and so we'll just leave it off. And then we'll just say, oh, well, P1 is efficiently solvable, period. Now that's a kind of model independence, but I think it's a, it's a quite weak form of model independence. It's kind of like a, like a syntactic uh, version of model independence. So, I mean, it's not uninteresting, but I, I don't think it's, it's that interesting, uh, a notion of model independence. What I think is, uh, uh, and, and, so, and, and what emphasizes that it's not so useful a notion to characterize model independence is that we could say essentially the same thing if BQP was a universal model, because I could give the same, I could do exactly the same thing I did here, just replace probabilistic Turing machine with quantum universal quantum uh, computer and so on. And then I, could, I would still be able to say this. And so I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not really, uh, I'm not really compelled by this kind of uh, notion of model independent that, that comes from the universality thesis. What I think is a far more interesting notion, uh, a thesis is the so-called invariance thesis. Okay, and so under this notion, the idea is that given some model of computation MI and some model of computation MJ, assuming that these are reasonable models, uh, so physically realizable in some sense, then the invariance thesis states that I can always convert a computation under this model into a computation in this model that requires only a polynomial number of extra steps. And so these models are efficiently simulable by one another. So now notice that here, the kind of model independence that's being alluded to is a much stronger form, right? So there's a model independence that's explicitly here, unlike the case, unlike the case there. So in a really great paper, I recommend you read this actually, Van M. de Boas uh, writes the following, and I, so I disagree with this, I disagree with this passage, but again, this is kind of like, it's kind of what I was saying earlier. So like, this comes at the very beginning of this article, and it's a bold claim that's made, but then not really defended, and not, not really important to what's being done in the paper. So, but nevertheless, he says it, and I wanna, I wanna point to it. And so he writes on this, in this paper, the fundamental complexity classes, P and NP, so he's talking about, uh, he, he's going through a little bit of the history. He says, they became part of a fundamental hierarchy, log space, uh, n log space, p, n, p, p space, x time, and so on. And again, the theory faced a face problem that each of these classes has a machine dependent definition and that efficient simulations are needed before one can claim that these classes are in fact machine independent and represent fundamental concepts of computational complexity. It seems therefore that complexity theory as we know it today is based on the assumption that the invariance thesis holds. So I wanna take issue with, with uh, especially that latter part. So one thing I wanna point out that, I mean, first of all, uh, these complexity theory classes, I mean, strictly speaking, these are classes of languages, right? And so when we compare them, we're comparing different languages to one another. So to say that the problem primes is efficiently computable. Uh, is, is for, say that the the, cla the, the the class primes is efficient is is in the class P is to say that the language the language consisting of binary representations of prime numbers is one of the languages that falls under P, and so we don't need we already have a kind of model independence here, right? Because these languages are all. I mean, they're all languages. And so we well, we have a kind of mo notion of model independence that we can use to compare classes with one another. So I'm not sure why we actually need 
to have a machine independent notion of these classes in addition to that. Further, by thinking of these classes in terms of the underlying model, we see that there are deep consequences. So for example, to the statement that P is equal to NP, the reason why this statement, this question is interesting is because, is because of the way P is instantiated by a Turing, by a Turing machine and because of the way, because of what would, what the kind of machine that instantiates a, a non-deterministic Turing machine. Right? It's because we're thinking of the underlying models that these questions actually have any philosophical interest at all, right? And so, and so I want to deny that complexity theory is based on, in the sense that he that, that Andy Boas wants to is writing here. Now, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not against the grain of computational complexity theory here. I think there's like there's there 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 are people who think the same thing. So I want to quote Lance Fort now, and Lance Fort now writes: By no means does computational complexity rest upon a universality. So he's talking about the universality thesis, but I think the same could be said. And I think implicitly he's saying the same thing about the invariance thesis. So he writes: By no means does computational complexity rest upon a universality of Turing efficiency thesis. The goal of computational complexity is to consider different notions of efficient computation and compare the relative strengths of these, of these models. Quantum, quantum computing does not break the computational complexity paradigm, but rather fits nicely within it. I think that's, I think that's entirely correct. Now, if anything underlies computational complexity theory, I would argue that it's this, this idea, this, I'll, I'll call it like the, poly, the, the polynomial principle that identifies polynomial resource costs with the, with the concept of efficient. Now, even this though, even, even if this like, like effect, even this like in actuality functions as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a principle that we use as, the, as a basis for defining our complexity theory classes, it's still the case that this is going to break down, right? So these, so on the order of, n to the k is something that we define for the worst case, and it's still also defined asymptotically. But if we think of, so if you think of just a concrete example, right? If you think of, like, let's say, consider an, an example of a program that takes n to the 1,000 steps to, to complete versus a program that takes two to the n over 1,000 steps to complete. Now, except for a very large n, this program is going to be, it's going to be much more efficient in practice than this one. Right. It doesn't mean that that the that, that the that the polynomial thesis is false per se, because I mean, as you as you as n goes to infinity, it's it's going to end up being the case that this one is the more efficient one. But in practice, we're typically we're typically faced with 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 you know like real fine with real problem sets that are not that are not uh, that we don't need to solve for unbounded n. And so, for all but the the abstract theoretical uh, consideration. We might say that efficient really doesn't doesn't really capture what what we want the distinction that we want to make between uh, between uh, efficient and non-efficient uh, problems. But that's okay, right? Because we need to understand what this really amounts to. And so here's a nice quote by by Scott Aronson. And so he writes, "Of the big problems solvable in polynomial time, matching, linear programming, primality testing, and so on." Most of them really do have practical algorithms. And of the big problems that we think take exponential time, they're improving circuit minimization and so on. Most of them really don't have practical algorithms. So that's the empirical skeleton holding up our fatty muscle. So the idea is that we have this criterion. It's a mathematical criterion, right? Uh, it's a worst case notion. It's defined in the asymptotic regime. And the claim is that this is a useful notion because we find in practice that it maps on to the distinctions that we want to make between, between the processes that we generally take to be efficient and the processes that, the processes that we generally take to be not efficient. And it's emphasized as well by, by, uh, by, by Jack Edmonds in this, in this paper from 1965 in which he introduced this polynomial uh, a principle. So, I mean, it's called the Cobham Edmonds thesis because, in parallel, uh, Alan Cobham introduced it as well. But Jack Edmonds writes in that paper, which has a great title, it's called Paths, Trees, and Flowers. <laughs> but anyway, so in this paper, Jack Edmonds writes, 
uh, writes, it would be unfortunate for any rigid criterion to inhibit the practical development of algorithms, which are either not known or known not to conform nicely to the criterion, which he himself put forward in his paper. Many of the best algorithmic ideas known today would suffer by such theoretical pedantry. And on the other hand, many important algorithmic ideas in electrical switching theory are obviously not good in our sense. However, if only to motivate the search for good practical algorithms, it is important to realize that it is mathematically sensible to even question their existence. For one thing, the task can then be described in terms of concrete conjectures. So in addition to, like, ma to mapping on empirically to what we pre-theoretically think of as good and as bad, it also, because we yes. We have a question from Patricia. Yeah, sure. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask about the quote from Aronson because I, like, I, I'm not very familiar with complexity theory, but from what I have seen, it seems that people say, oh, this takes exponential time whenever they can't find a polynomial algorithm for it. Um, so in a way, that would be somewhat circular reasoning. I'm sure Scott Aronson doesn't mean that, but do you have any more uh, to say about that? Like why... He might not mean that. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure I quite understand. I mean, so so people tend to use exponential in in like people use people tend to use the term exponential as a synonym for hard. Um, yeah. They don't stri they're not strictly speaking the same. But when people when people talk in those terms, they're they're not. I mean, and like they're just they're speaking loosely. Right, so like tip, like, like often exponential is used as a synonym for hard, but really, I mean, exponential maps onto the class EXP. Sure. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I mean is, um, so most of the, so yeah, most of the big problems that we say, oh, this can be solved in polynomial polynomial time, is because we say, look, here's the algorithm that solves it in polynomial time. That's great. That's you know, no further questions need to be asked. For the problems that we say, oh, I think this can be solved in exponential time. It's usually because we can't find an algorithm that can solve it in polynomial time. So in that sense, that distinction, like I don't care whether it's exponential, it could just be polynomial with a huge constant, just that I have found the algorithm for it. Right. I mean, so I mean, that's a fair point, but I, so I don't think it's circular because what we're, so uh, I think we need to distinguish between informal notions on the one hand and formal notions on the other hand. Mm -hmm. So we have this, we call it a pre-theoretic idea that this task that we want to perform is probably hard, right? And then, and then, and then, and then we can form, and then we, and we can formalize by saying, well, well, actually, we can show that we can't find the polynomial algorithm. And so we 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 expect it to be hard, and it turns out, I mean, it's not. I mean, I would call it more of a process of reflective equilibrium, kind of, you know, like so, like the the formalization process kind of formalizes what we mean. And then from that, we, we develop further ideas about what we expect to be hard and not. And then we kind of, you know, so it's kind of circular, but not viciously circular, I would say. Sure. You know, it's kind of, it's just kind of like an interplay between informal and formal notions. I mean, the thing to emphasize is just that at all stages, we don't blindly follow rules. We, there's, there's an element of human judgment involved and, and reflection involved. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's what, what Scott's trying to get at there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, where was I? Right, yeah, so, so I was saying that, so one thing that's good about this thesis is not only that it, it maps on to our, our informal pre-theoretic notions of what's efficient and not efficient, right? It, it also helps to mathematically state the question as to whether a process is efficient or not. So it might be that eventually that this criterion isn't 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 exact enough to really map onto what we what we what we want to call efficient or not efficient. But in that case, we'll have to find a different criterion. But in the meantime, like like until it continues not to be useful, it's it's it, it's it's mathematically useful in, in the sense that it helps us to ask ask mathematically meaningful questions. And so that's what uh, Jack Edmonds is getting at. At the, at the at the at the end of that quote there. So the goal of computational complexity theory, I would I, I want to argue, is is not to give 
is it to give a model independent characterization of efficient computation? So I would say that no, that's not really the fundamental goal of, com of computational complexity theory. I would, I, would, I would be more inclined to go along with this the quote from uh, Lance Ford now, that computational complexity theory should be better thought of as a practical science. It has a normative character. Model independence is an interesting and important notion that plays a part in the theory, but it's not an essential notion, strictly speaking, right? I would say fundamentally what computational complexity theory is about making distinctions between the, 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 the tasks that we want to actually perform and making conceptual distinctions that will, that in most cases will map on to the distinctions we make in practice. Now, with respect to the invariance thesis, I mean, although I argued against this thesis as something that underlies complexity theory, I think that, that it's an extremely useful notion. And it's even more useful when we transform it from a thesis to a principle, right? So because it's, because, so even though the invariance thesis may not be uh, true universally, well, first of all, it's defined with respect to reasonable models, even if that's not true, it's still the case that we have discovered that, at least so far, every classical model that we can think of is polynomially equivalent to every other classical model. And so we thought that all models were, were this way. But now it seems that we've discovered that the quantum computational models are not captured by this. Nevertheless, it seems to be the case that all quantum computational models measurement-based computation, circuit-based computation, adiabatic, topological form field theory, and so on, they're all polynomial equivalent to each other. So we have now, we, we have, we can think of the invariance thesis more usefully as an invariance principle, as a kind of a mathematical, a methodological principle through which we organize and carve out the structure of the theory. So we used to think that there was one meaningful complexity theory, uh, there, there was there was one class of models that I'm sorry, there, there was one class of models that we call reasonable that are all polynomially efficient to one another, and now we've discovered that there's another class of models that's distinct from this one, but even in this case, we find that they're all polynomially equivalent to one another, and arguably this this might give us I mean arguably considering the way that these are distinguished from one another, which will which will which will inform and will inform that question by considering the physics, presumably, that will give us an insight into, into the computational landscape, right? And so we have a kind of notion of relative model independence that we can use the invariance principle as, a, as a, and we can use the invariance principle as a way to carve out that conceptual space into these relative notions of model independence. And in that sense, I think the invariance principle is an enormously useful. Uh, methodological principle for comp computational complexity theory. So in that sense, I mean, I, I'm not even sure that I even even so I would I wouldn't necessarily say that the invariance principle has to be satisfied in every case, right? So it could be the case that all the models, none of the models were computationally equivalent to one another, but that would still be interesting, right? Because I mean, it would it would make complexity theory a lot more cumbersome. But actually, that's the way it was in the in the six in the early sixties. Anyway, before the polynomial thesis was formulated, right? Because we had different classes of Turing machine, and we were we were comparing one tape Turing machines versus two tape Turing machines, and so on. But even even if that were the case, even if we couldn't carve out any equivalence classes of models, that wouldn't invalidate the invariance principle because it would still we would still have discovered something about the computational landscape. It would be perhaps less interesting than we thought because you know it would be it'd be harder to actually to 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 make more to make the general claims that we might want to make, but we could still do complexity theory, even if it didn't turn out to be the case. We would just have many more many more uh, equivalence classes of models. Okay? So the invariance principle does function very usefully as a kind of method methodological principle through which we organize and carve out the structure of the theory, and. And what it gives us is a notion, I mean, when it, when it is able to, to carve out some structure, it gives us a relative notion of model independence. So to conclude, I, 
I argue that the goal of complexity theory is not to give a model independent characterization of efficient computation. I mean, it's one of the, it's one of the goals, but it's not the fundamental goal. Fundamentally, computational complexity theory is a practical science. It has a normative character. Model independence is an interesting and important notion that we get at in computational complexity theory sometimes, but it's not foundational in a sense that is claimed by, by some, in some of those quotes that I gave you. So does quantum computing break the paradigm of computational complexity theory? I mean, I hope I've convinced you that no, it doesn't. But what it does do, it illuminates computational complexity theory by reminding us of the point of the whole thing. And with that, I'll just end. Thanks.